The book is called The Natural Order of Money. It's quite a beautiful book. It's very elegant. It's a very short book, and it's very tightly edited, although it's also a book that, for me, indicated, you know, one of the ways that you can distinguish high-quality thought in some sense from low-quality thought is that you can tell in a high-quality book that every sentence has been thought through using multiple sentences that aren't in the book, right? So there's a depth of idea that that uh, has been compacted into the concepts, and there's an elegance of presentation. And it's a beautiful book, and so that's also extraordinarily interesting. But it's it's very straightforwardly written. It reminds me in that sense of Matthew Pajot's recent book called uh, this, the, the, the Language of Creation, which is about this long, and, and is analogous to this book in some ways, although more on the theological side. So this book has eight chapters. And so I'll start... There's little chapter summaries at the beginning, and I'll just throw them at Roy for now, and he can comment on them. So, chapter one, what makes cooperation possible and sustainable between people in the natural world? We must turn to the natural order. Three chapters specifically, and then I think we'll close this out, concentrating on what they concentrate on, because this turns to the issue of money. Ecological accountability is a fact of nature and of all human cooperative systems. So the idea there would be if you transgress against the principles of ecology, you're playing a non-playable game, you're gonna fail. Only the service economy is able to artificially and temporarily ignore ecological accountability. The environmentalists make a case like that, although it's more of an explicitly anti-industrial case, right? When ecological accountability is manipulated or forgotten, so that's the relationship between the economy and the underlying environmental structure, the relationship between the real and service economies becomes parasitic. Very interesting turn of phrase there, parasitic, because it means a parasite actually destroys the source of value while consuming it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's nothing about it that renews and revivifies. The The natural standard must be reified and extended to all members, ensuring that ecological accountability remains at the heart of cooperation. So the idea there, in some sense, this natural standard to be reified means that the signal that it contains has to be propagated reliably through the abstractions of the system. That's, That's right. Okay. Ecological accountability, this is where it gets more practical, is not an ideal or promise, but a lived reality. And then we switch to money. Money extends the natural standard. So that's that's the key element of your book in some real sense, right? Yes. Genuine money extends the natural standard in an ecologically valid manner. That's, That's right. your claim. Because it's taking that natural standard and it's reflecting it in the object itself. It has mm. it has two features. Any commodity has two features. It's a measure in the sense that it's a weight of something relative mm. to other things, relative to the farmer's harvest this season, relative to the amount of land. Right. That so you it contains put. an intrinsic information. Yes, but this information is changing relative to the natural order, but the natural order is the is the arbiter. But then it's mm. also a reward in the sense that irrespective of whether it's a good measure or a bad measure, it's something you need as an input. You can mm-hmm. do something with it. Mm-hmm. It's useful. Mm-hmm. And so every commodity has that feature. Uh, and, and, and so when we so use... So your, your notion with fiat money is that it's stripped of its intrinsic information. It's neither a measure nor a reward. I mean, it's, it's a Which reward. is why the Nobel laureate would have been able to say, well, the only difference between copper and gold is subjective desire. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, it's funny because Aristotle in the politics says that money shouldn't be pursued for its own sake. Mm-hmm. It has mm-hmm. to be something that's a good, that's useful. And the fiat money is something that's just pursued for its own sake. You, you don't receive the fiat money so you can do anything. Right, so that's another place where it's ethically un, uncoupled, is yes. because it doesn't have that intrinsic value. You or get the idea that usefulness. Right, usefulness that and, and remember, in the cryptocurrency space, they've been trying to tell us now, and, and you know, I have a, a great respect for the cryptocurrency community, cryptocurrency space, but they've been trying to tell us, well, it's, things can have utility by virtue of them just being a medium of exchange, by being mm-hmm. able to exchange onwards. Mm-hmm. And they build scarcity into it. Yes, but I just don't think that's true. Right, you right, know, I, right. I, I think that nobody, think about it even in financial markets, nobody just wants to have fiat money sitting in their bank account. They want to invest the fiat money to generate some interest. They want to buy a stock. They want to buy property. So so nobody actually wants to just sit and own the fiat currency unless they're buying it on leverage relative to some other fiat currency like the Japanese yen. Well, why can't you say the same thing about gold? Because the gold always has that embedded optionality to its owner. 
I can sell it to someone that needs to turn it into jewelry, or I can sell it to NASA, which needs to add it to a rocket, or I can sell it to Apple, which right. Needs so to at use minimum, it always has that fundamental. Yeah, utility. your your yeah, choice yeah. to take the gold and treat it as what's called a storehouse of value doesn't change its intrinsic natural yeah, utility. Okay. okay. Um, anyways, here's the summary of the eighth and final chapter. When money is gold, and as I said, that's the fundamental thesis of the book. When money is gold, cooperation between people and nature is sustainable. That's a hell of a claim, that. It'd be interesting to see what people make of that in the comments. When money is gold, cooperation between people and nature is sustainable. Gold money remains a stable measure and reward in both generative and degenerative cycles. And then he concludes with this. We live in an age of contrived monies, reflected, let's say, in voluntary inflation, the printing of money, and parasitic economies. The definition there would be economies that are bubbling upward, but not replenishing the source. That's a good way of thinking about it. A solution must be given by nature and not the service economy. And then the closing is gold. It's quite, it's quite, a, it's quite a claim. Gold is the perfect mirror of ecological accountability. So, well, it's hard for me to evaluate the book, you know, um, because I'm not an expert in these topics. Um, I've read a lot of books. This seems to me to be a very good book. It's very clear. I found the argument very compelling. It's a very interesting argument, at least. There may be things wrong with it that I certainly don't understand. There's probably things wrong with it that you don't understand. But I definitely enjoyed reading it, and it's, made, it's given me an awful lot to think about. And I do think it's beautifully written and is also a beautiful book. So that's The Natural Order of Money. If you're interested in this discussion, I would recommend the book. It's a pretty short read. It's pretty damn clear. And uh, I'd like to thank Roy for talking to me today. 